What's going on, Imperials? It's Emperor Cubone here. I may be in the minority, but there are few things that I love more than starting out a new Pokémon game. I find it so enjoyable to wander away from home for the first time and see what they provide to work with for building a team. However, not every starting area of a game is so useful, so I thought we would rank them and see which early areas from each region is worst all the way to the best. Just a few ground rules, I'm going to be considering a starting area as the routes before the first major city that you'll come across after you leave your hometown. Sometimes this will be the first gym, and sometimes not. This would also include any surrounding areas that you could access before being blocked off for any story progress. Also, for the purposes of the ranking, I will largely be prioritizing variety of Pokémon and ease of access, as well as how adequately I feel this makeup represents the region as a whole. So starting at the bottom with number 15, the worst has absolutely got to be the Unova region's Route 1. Now before you get too bent out of shape, the Unova region is lucky because it gets another shot at the list with Black and White 2, but in the original Gen 5 games, the early stages were painfully sparse, only having a Patrat and a Lillipup on Route 1. Now, when I was talking about representing the region, I mainly meant having ready access to the common birds and bugs and what is affectionately referred to as rodents, and here all we've got is Patrat. P-Dove and the two bug options are all locked away past the first gym, which is such a weird thing to do when the only other Pokémon that you can find besides pure normal types before the first major town is a Purloin, and it doesn't even change by season in these games. Now, luckily, I would not consider Accumula Town a major city, so we can include the Dream Yard, which you are able to visit just to the side of the first gym, but even then, the only thing that it adds is a Muna. I guess you could technically count the monkey gift that changes depending on your starter. That would save it from being totally awful, but if this is all they gave us after cutting off every Pokémon that has ever come before, no wonder everyone was so mad at the Unova region. However, at number 14, just objectively speaking, I have to put the Kanto region next. This isn't really a surprise, I guess, but limited numbers do come into play when the only possible encounters on Route 1 are Pidgey and Rattata. But at least they aren't both pure normal, right? What puts it slightly above dead last is because once you get to Viridian City, you can access Route 22. Obviously, you can't enter Victory Road yet, but you can pick up either form of Nidoran or a Spearow. And sure, Spearow might be redundant, but at least it's something. Also, for clarity, I will be counting the southern part of Route 2, but not Viridian Forest itself. However, you can still find a Caterpie or Weedle in that area, so you can get all of the regional staples right from the start of the game. The Unova region could take some notes on that. Just above that at number 13, I feel like the Mankey variant is different enough to warrant a mention, since in Yellow version and the Gen 3 games, Mankey is included on Route 22, which means a nice counter for Brock. However, I am going to have to give the number 12 spot to the Let's Go games. Sure, they lose Mankey, but they gain Oddish or Bellsprout as early as Route 1. That is the first time the beginning route has ever been changed in the history of Kanto, and it fulfills the same function in beating Brock, but carries you on to beat Misty and resist Lieutenant Surge as well. Also, there is the fact that you can find literal legendary Pokémon in the skies of this route there, but we're only going to be talking about the first time that you go through, so no HMs need be considered this time around. But hey, at least you can say that Kanto has improved every time. Number 11 isn't far off with the Johto region. Since Route 29 does house four different Pokémon, so that's nice, the ones that we've seen already along with Sentret, and you can even find a Hoot Hoot here, but only at night. Now, technically there are plenty more Pokémon that can be found on this route, but those are in Headbutt Trees, and since you can't learn Headbutt until after Azalea Town, it doesn't really seem that relevant to me. What is, however, is the access to Route 46 that you can explore right away, where the grass has Geodude, Spearow, and Jigglypuff. It'd be nice to have some Gen 2 Pokémon here, sure, but I won't complain for variety. Now, I am counting Cherry Grove City as the first major town, you might not agree with that, but if you wanted to, you could count Route 30, which would open you up to having Caterpie, Weedle, Spinarak, and Ladybug, 
all version exclusives, which does help. But it still isn't enough to beat the number 10 spot, which is the Crystal variant. Here you can find Hopip immediately on Route 29, so that's yet another reason to never pick Chikorita, and you can potentially find a Fan P on Route 46. I'm not saying that it's easy, but it is a great reward for being so early. And then if you do count Route 30 past Cherry Grove, at night only, you would also have the chance to find a Zubat and a Poliwag. Now we're starting to get somewhere. Number 9 I think is where we'll see the Kalos region. Now it does showcase a much greater variety than ever before, but we have to factor in the quality of selection here. You can't even run into a Pokémon until after Aquacord Town, but having the new trio front and center is so relieving and makes the game feel fresh. That is, until you run into a bunch of old Pokémon instead, and I am including Santaloon Forest and Route 3 in this, so as nice as it is to get the type coverage of Pikachu and all of the elemental monkeys, it just seems a little much to have Bunnelby, Zigzagoon, Bidoof, and even Dunsparce all before the first gym or Scatterbug, Caterpie, Weedle, or Burmy, you're not going to really need more than one of those types on your team, so it just feels like they're simply present to pad out the numbers. Azuril is a nice touch on Route 3 though, showcasing the new fairy type. If we were to include Route 22, then things would be a little different, but I'm not so sure that that should count. But if you think it should, then that reminds me of the number 8 spot, where we'll see the Unova region again which is a huge improvement on before, since Route 19 at least has two different types of Pokémon, but it gets much better. Route 20, just before Verbank, actually has the regional bird and the capability of catching both regional bugs. And then they just kind of threw in a Sunkern there, I don't really know why, but there are also shaking spots in the grass that allow you to catch an Audino or a Dunsparce. And not to be outdone, the ranch detour you can take allows you to once again capture a Lillipop while also getting Azuril, Psyduck, Mareep, and Riolu. Granted, you can't have a fairy in the Gen 5 games, but the rest of those are Pokémon that could easily take you through the next few gyms, if not the whole game. That takes us to the number 7 spot, which unfortunately is the Sinnoh region. I wanted it to be much higher since I personally love some of the selection, but it once again comes down to quality. You can reach the trifecta as soon as Route 202, so that is nice, but Cricketot was so weak that it barely counts as a team member. Luckily, you can also pick up a Shinx here, which in Sinnoh is a favorite of many and can help us out a lot. But then we're at the major city of Jubilife. Now, there are some offshoots that we can explore before story progression, such as going west to pick up the old rod. So since we can fish the first time we're here, Magikarp is on the table. And we can go north to pick up a Badoo, and possibly even check out the Ravaged Path for a Geodude, Zubat, or Psyduck. Also, you can find a Wurmple here in the Platinum version on Route 204, which I guess is better than a Cricketot, but it's gonna be hard to evolve that Badoo or Magikarp before the gym, and I don't think that Psyduck is really gonna stay around for long when better water options come along. So when you can really only rely on maybe half of a team, it's difficult to place it much higher. Next at number 6, I would put the Galar region. Sword and Shield had their detractors, but if we're just going by the first areas of the game, it's a bounty of riches. You start off by being able to see Squavit, Rookity, Wooloo, and Nickit in the overworld, but if you stick around long enough, you'll see that randomly in the grass, you can also find the extra Blitbug, Grubbin, Caterpie, and even Hoot Hoot. And then you arrive right at Wedgehurst. But I'm not gonna be cutting it off so quickly because I do think that it's fair to include Route 2 on the way to Professor Magnolia's house in this beginning area, because really there's no reason to ever come back here once you're done. But this extra stretch gives us the chance to catch a Yamper, Choodle, and Galarian Zigzagoon. On top of that, there are also the old Pokémon of Purloin, Lotad, and Seedot. So you could easily build a full team of Pokémon that are unique to this region before you even leave the Professor's house, with other choices being there if you still want them. You might not keep them all around for your whole journey, but it's just so refreshing to have so many more options than usual. Now for number 5, I'm going to say the Paldea region. This could be a little tricky depending on what you classify as the early parts of the game, because you can just wander around a whole lot but I'm saying that it's anything from your home to Los Platos, known as the Southern Province Area 1, but mostly Poco Path. 
So that gives us Lechonk, Tarantula, and Pommy, with the older Pokémon Fletchling, Hoppip, and Scatterbug included as well. That could be it, but realistically the area in between the Lighthouse and Los Platos should probably be counted while being able to collect the likes of Ralts, Buizel, Psyduck, Azuril, Paldean Wooper, Iglybuff, Fido, Magikarp, Ghastly, and more. And arguably it could even be further out if you go out on your own to explore, finding things like Drowsy, Flamigo, Surskit, Choodle, or Combi. This isn't out of the question, however the game does direct you forward, so I think most people would likely follow that path, but even that narrow field has more than enough to fill out a team before you even reach your first rival battle. Maybe with just a little too many superfluous options bloating out the decks on the side. You might be surprised that it's made it this far, but number four is solidly the Hoenn region. You start on Route 101 with the nice spread of Zigzagoon, Wurmple, and Poochyena, all of them being totally different types, so that's pretty rare for a first route and obviously calling Oldale Town Major would be quite generous, so we also get to go up to Route 103 and find a Wingle, and then over to Route 102 that doubles our haul with the possibilities for Surskit, Lotad, or Seedot, and even Ralts. If you can find one of those early on, you're going to want to keep it. And even after arriving at Petalburg, the only story progression happens on past that, so I'm comfortable even including Route 104, where you can find a Talo, once again uniting all of the regional tropes. I would cut it off there, but if you felt so inclined, you could count all the way to Rustboro. Then you would get to throw Slackoff, Skitty, Ninkata, and Wismer into the ranks. So to me, Hoenn has some of the most enjoyable early game fun for just how well you can build your team before you even reach halfway to your first gym. Now in the top three, I would put the Alola region. This is like the variety of Galar, but even better. Route 1 on Mele Mele Island starts you with Pikipek, Young Goose, Ladyba, and Caterpie, but that's just in the daytime. You can also get Spinarak and Alolan Rattata at night. But once again, when you get closer to Iki Town, you can find even more with Pichu and Grubbin. So the trifecta of regional patterns stays strong here as well. You also get the unique opportunities to catch the already evolved forms of Metapod and Pikachu, but specifically through the SOS feature of Pokémon calling for help, you can also encounter a Happini as well. There is technically another path on Route 1, but you need a Tauros to break through, so we'll just leave those Pokémon off the list for now. However, there is even more down the Howley outskirts where you can find a Wingle and Slowpoke next to Professor Kakui's house. But even that's not all, because while areas like Ten Carat Hill and Mele Mele Sea are considered separate, the entire trainer school is within the bounds of Route 1 according to the game. And so the Pokémon that you find on the grounds, like Magnemite, Alolan Meowth, and Alolan Grimer, count as Route 1 Pokémon too. A Poison and Dark and a Steel-type in the first Route territory is insane, but by the point that you can find them, you might already be invested in a full team of other choices. So I know that people ridicule the early portions of Alola for their excessive cutscenes, but really they've got a pretty astounding variety of choices, both a lot more than you need to include or what you might expect, all wrapped in that beautiful tropical feel. So we're at number two, and you may have forgotten, but here is where I will place the Hisui region. As I said, I personally appreciated the Sinnoh early game, and this is just that on steroids. You've got your standard Starly, Bidoof, Shanks from Sinnoh, and even the Wurmples from Platinum are here. Well, technically they're over in the area called the Horseshoe Plains, but I should point out that I'm basically considering this area as the early route style section above the river and maybe just the path to the second camp as well. So in all that space, you can find the Fire-type Ponyta pretty easily, as well as Buizel, Cricketot, Mime Jr., Drifloon, Pichu, Munchlax, Zubat, Burmy, Geodude, and even Stantler. But by far the most impressive aspect is that Eevee can be found here. And in Legends Arceus, you can rest assured that you will find multiple Pokémon if you wait long enough, which means that you could pick any and all evolutions that you want before you even reach the secondary camp. Some people claimed that the pace of this game just dragged you along far too much, but once they cut me loose, I easily spent a good three hours just running around exploring this area before I ever even tried to cross that bridge, which made getting sucked into the early section of the Hisui region gloriously fun. 
If you didn't take the time to explore around here on your own, then you're really missing out. So now we come to the number one spot, and we're actually going back to the Alola region with Ultra Sun and Moon. So you know how good we said Alola was already? Yeah, the Ultra games included all of that and just added on to it. They kept everything from before, but added a Baniri to the standard route area, I guess you'd call it. And Rockruff is here now too, in the breakable section, so just keep that in mind. But down at the Howley outskirts, you can now find an Inkei, giving you a strong psychic type super soon after starting the game. And of course it is a dark type as well, but we still have plenty of those over by the trainer school, and even more since Zorua is here now too. You know, the Pokemon that was ridiculously hard to find the first two generations of its existence? Yeah, you can just find it outside in the schoolyard now. What a great gift to finally have easy access to such a rare and fan favorite Pokemon! But that's not all because the school area now also provides interactions with Drifloon and Ghastly for you to catch as well. I don't think we've ever in the history of Pokemon seen ghost types before the first major town, let alone so far before a normal type trial where they would be totally immune. And really, the embarrassment of riches doesn't stop at the arbitrary line into Howley City, because there you can find an Abra, Furfru, and Mime Jr. Just past it, you can find many other Pokemon, and that's not even counting Route 3, where you can potentially pick up a Halucha or a level 10 Salamence. Melee Melee Island has got some crazy stuff going on, and on top of the atmosphere and everything else, when you have a Pokemon lineup this widespread with enough options to build multiple teams while mixing together old favorites with the brand new flair and even some more underrepresented options, to me when comparing Pokemon composition and the overall feel of the game, this easily puts the Ultra games at the top slot for the early routes. If we were just talking about how fun they are to play, then this list would likely be shaken up quite a bit. Which region's early routes have the best makeup to you? Let me know down in the comments. Also be sure to leave a like, share this video, and subscribe so that you too can become an Imperial today. And until next time, stay grounded!